so this next talk is called Ma uh, Manufacturing Medical Countermeasures Against Catastrophic Biothreats, and will be joined by Daniel Gastrand. So Daniel has a master's in public administration and international development from the Harvard Kennedy School and an MBA from Harvard Business School. He also holds a bachelor's degree from Princeton University where he studied economics and public policy. He has worked as a management consultant with Bain and Company in South Africa and as a policy consultant with ID Insight in Uganda and India. Most recently, he was a visiting scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security where he researched US federal policy on pandemic preparedness and biosecurity. In July of this year, he'll be starting at the Office of Management and Budget at the US federal government as a program examiner. Please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you so much, um, Anjali. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, you know, just a quick note on my background. My um, background and expertise is in economics and is in business. I'm not a biologist or a scientist. So I'm gonna be focusing on the policy and business aspects of preparing for pandemics rather than the technical aspects. Now this research is research I've conducted in partnership with the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, but the views I will express are my own. Uh, I first wanna get a quick show of hands. Um, can you please raise your hand if you work in biosecurity or consider yourself knowledgeable on pandemic preparedness? And then Raise, yeah, okay, a lot of, a lot of like half-half. Raise your hand if you uh, feel like you know very little and are a complete uh, novice to this space. Okay, so quite a, quite a nice range. Um, great, well, with that in mind, let's begin. The year is 2025. You wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning to your phone ringing. You pick up the phone, and on the other end, you hear the voice of the chief of staff of the White House. She says, you're on the line with the President of the United States of America. Good morning, says the President of the United States of America. As you know, we are amidst a terrifying pandemic outbreak of the Clade X virus that is threatening to destroy the global system. And we urgently need you to report to the White House to help coordinate the US response. You say, OK. You throw on your pants, you jump in your car, you drive to the White House. And at the White House, you're greeted by your new chief of staff who says, let's get you up to speed. We are continuing our coverage of a new and deadly infectious disease. The virus has some genetic elements of the Nipah virus. The care of these patients requires extraordinary effort. We cannot and will not voluntarily take patients from other hospitals. The creation and intentional release of the Clade X virus. The impact of not doing something has lots of consequences. We can't retreat from the rest of the world. The continuity of government here cannot be overestimated. A federal quarantine of this scale is uh, unprecedented. The question everywhere, when will there be a vaccine? We have got to engage the private sector. They know that we don't have a vaccine yet. They want vaccines to be prioritized. I would not want to pull those people back. And we need on the ground to be able to uh, assure protection of our first responders. This is a non-starter. I'm going to need these people I got this feeling in a whole lot of other places. More than 40 countries are reporting outbreaks and many more are suspected of having cases. Leadership requires doing things that are oftentimes unpopular. This issue has the amazing capacity to be number 11 on anybody's list of 10 most important items. We have been unbelievably weakened by this crisis. What the world will look like when it's done is still very uncertain. This was a tabletop exercise conducted by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security with senior current and former members of US government. They ran epidemiological modeling and predicted that within a year or so of the release of this type of virus, you could see 150 million deaths worldwide and a 50% drop in global GDP. Now, if these numbers look completely historically unprecedented, they're not. We often forget that the biggest killers in the 20th century were infectious disease outbreaks. The 1918 Spanish flu in a single year killed more people than World War II. But could 
a pandemic outbreak be even worse than this? Could it be something that could permanently harm and alter the trajectory of human civilization? Or could it pose truly an existential threat to human society? Now there's legitimate and ongoing debate about how seriously we should take that risk. I will leave you with two historical anecdotes to inform your thinking. 2012, scientists are working on the H5N1 avian flu virus. It's a variant of the flu with extremely high case fatality rates, but it's not transmissible between mammals through respiratory pathways. They managed to make some tweaks that makes it transmissible by air. Subsequent modeling suggests that the release of this virus accidentally from a lab could kill upwards of a billion people. 1993. The omnicidal cult, Am Shinrikyo, releases what they attempt to, um, to be a wide area anthrax attack in Tokyo in their efforts to exterminate humanity. Now luckily, Am Shinrikyo did not have the capabilities to successfully execute this attack. But the combination of the increasing capabilities of a synthetic biology to create devastating pathogens and the presence of individuals and groups who would use them against society is something that should make us all concerned. Okay, back to the White House. You're in your first meeting with the President of the United States, and the President says, tell me, what can we be doing to better prepare ourselves? What should we have been doing? So you'll quickly run through the list. We could be investing in basic research to better understand the biological pathways and mechanisms of disease. We could be building our arsenal of medical countermeasures against potentially catastrophic pathogens. We could improve governance planning and coordination. There are key gaps both within federal government and internationally to manage an effective response. We could improve our allocation of resources, target them towards the most severe and significant threats, especially deliberate and synthetic biology. We could improve our regulation of synthetic biology to prevent the wrong tools and pathogens from falling into the wrong hands. And finally, we could strengthen international diplomacy around biological security, such as the Biological Weapons Convention. Now the president says that's a great list, uh, but it's too late for most of this now. So let's focus on de developing and deploying a medical countermeasure. Now for the purposes of this session, let's assume that they have already developed a vaccine. And the question now is how quickly can we manufacture this vaccine and deploy it globally? The president says, you know, international economy is collapsing, millions of people are dying by the week. I want you to manufacture enough vaccine doses to cover the majority of the global population in the next three months. Can you do it? You look at the present, you say, you're not gonna like the answer to that question. As I said, we'll be focusing on manufacturing for this presentation. Uh, development of countermeasures is also crucial because it can take 10 to 15 years to produce a vaccine. But even under the optimistic scenario in which we have a vaccine, uh, manufacturing is gonna be way too slow to respond. The 2009 flu pandemic was potentially the, one of the, if not the fastest, production and scale-ups of a vaccine in history. And yet it still took nine months after the first case to, um, to reach full swing. You can see the blue line here is um, the course of the viral outbreak, and the red line is the scale up of vaccine delivery. Um, and there was a three month delay between the peak of the outbreak and um, full swing of vaccine delivery. And that was the best that we have ever managed to do. It turns out that the flu vaccine um, is the vaccine for which there is the most installed global capacity to respond to a global pandemic. Our capabilities have actually improved since 2009. Um, and this slide um, you know, summarizes, do we have the capacity to cover the global population, or at least a majority of the population in 12 months? What's the current excess capacity to produce the vaccine? And how quickly can we scale up? Um, for the, the flu vaccine, 
we um, can't quite cover the global population in 12 months, but under very optimistic assumptions, we can get within striking distance. Uh, unfortunately, no other vaccine comes anywhere even close to hitting those numbers. And it can take three to five years to build a single new factory for vaccine production. It can take between six to 12 months to repurpose existing capacity from producing one vaccine to another. Um, the figures are similar for most other categories of countermeasures, the one exception being broad spectrum antibiotics. And if it happens to be a bacteria that is susceptible against, say, penicillin, then we might be in okay shape. If not, we're really screwed. Okay. Fast forward five, or, sorry, rewind five years. It's 2019, it's current day. You get a very different call from the President of the United States. The President says, listen, you know, I know that we should be concerned about pandemic outbreaks. I know we should be concerned about synthetic biology. What can we do today to build out our manufacturing capabilities so that if a crisis occurs, we'll be better prepared? So first, it'll be useful to identify what are the main barriers preventing us from having improved surge production capabilities. The first are technical. Most processes to produce medical countermeasures, and I'm happy at the end to talk about these in greater detail, rely on expensive fixed equipment, very specialized processes that require specific know-how. It can take months for a team to get used to the specific manufacturing process for any given production line, such that it's quite difficult to take a factory that's producing one product and switch it to produce another. Now this is possible under narrow circumstances, um, but it tends to be pretty challenging. The second is economic barriers. It would be extremely socially valuable to invest in surge production capacity to help ensure against this you know, extreme risk scenario. But it's difficult for private companies to internalize those benefits as a return on their investment. This is because they would need to recoup quite a substantial financial investment in a crisis that might only happen once every 50 years. And the prices that they would have to charge to justify their investment from an economic perspective would likely be viewed politically as exorbitant and unacceptable. So this is not a play that any private investor is gonna be excited to make. Finally, there are regulatory barriers. There's extremely stringent regulation on the manufacturing of medical countermeasures called good, manu good manufacturing practices. Now these regulations are really important for protecting users of vaccines and antibiotics and other health products um, during peacetime. They're why vaccines have such high safety rates. Um, but they can slow down scale up in an emergency, especially because there are differences internationally. Okay. So I'm going to present three potential policy strategies that uh, we think could potentially help alleviate these barriers. Um, and I'll, I'll run through them quickly uh, and then dive into the first one. The first is to promote platform technologies. These are a category of manufacturing technologies that could be much more flexible and rapidly scalable than conventional manufacturing. They would have transformative impacts on the technical and economic barriers, but it would take at least five to 15 years to really get these products onto the market. It will require an investment of at least several billion dollars, if not much more than that. Second is there's a slew of ideas that could bolster the capabilities of the federal government to respond um, to an emergency and invest in countermeasures. And the third is some ideas around improving planning between the public and the private sector to make sure we've got strong emergency response plans. I wanna take you through platform technologies because I think these are going to be our best bet. And it's useful to understand these by contrasting them to conventional manufacturing. In conventional ma vaccine manufacturing, I apologize for the formatting um, on this screen, um, for a vaccine, typically what you do is you attenuate the target pathogen against which you wanna stimulate immunity. 
you're gonna grow that pathogen, say a virus, in a large bioreactor in a vat of cells. You're gonna extract and filter the virus, the attenuated virus, administer it to the patient whose immune system then generates immunity against that virus. This turns out to be quite a slow and inflexible manufacturing process. By contrast, platform technologies use a specific delivery mechanism, a platform on which you can deliver many different types of products. And I'll give the example of DNA-based vaccine manufacturing. In a DNA-based vaccine, first you identify a specific protein on the target pathogen, an antigen, which can stimulate immunity. You identify the gene sequence of this protein, and you synthesize that gene, se that gene sequence in DNA. You attach it to some delivery mechanism that can bring it into the cells, you administer it. The patient's cells then create that protein using their own molecular machinery. And it's that protein that then stimulates the immune response. This is much faster and more flexible because it allows manufacturers to type in a new and different DNA sequence um, and quickly switch between producing one product to another using the same delivery mechanism you could switch over in the span of weeks, maybe even days. The problem is that um, we're still five to 15 years away from these products really maturing. There are a few barriers that public policy could alleviate. The first is insufficient private sector investment for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. I think there should be massive public financing, at least on the order of several billion dollars over the next decade, um, if not ideally much more than that that could accelerate research into these kinds of vaccines. Um, the second is that we could accelerate regulatory um, processes for these platforms by regulating them based on delivery mechanism rather than by disease type and by using a variety of tools the FDA has to accelerate product approval. Um, finally, I'll quickly talk through some ideas to strengthen the capabilities of federal government um, to invest and respond in this space. The federal government already runs, um, or I should say partially invests in facilities that are designed for surge manufacturing, um, but they haven't yet fully delivered on their promise. We could help alleviate those challenges by establishing multi-year appropriations for the government to invest in the long term in medical countermeasures. We could make the Department of Health and Human Services contracting with private sector agencies um, and organizations more flexible. Uh, and we could allocate emergency response funding that the federal government could draw upon immediately in an emergency. The final recommendation is to create government industry planning forums to better coordinate um, emergency regulatory planning between private sector companies and the federal government. This last slide is just a list of ideas for people who are interested in getting involved in biosecurity, who are interested in careers in this space. Um, I'm not gonna go through these, but I will leave them here and you can take a look at them after um, to get some ideas of how you might be able to contribute. Thank you. Just a quick reminder to audience members that we do have the opportunity to take up some questions during Q&A at the end of this session. Um, in the meantime, our discussant for this section will be Greg Lewis. So Greg is a DPhil scholar at the Future of Humanity Institute where he investigates long run impacts and potential catastrophic risk from advancing biotechnology. He is a DPhil student in Michael Bonsall's mathematical ecology group. Previously, he was an academic clinical fellow in public health medicine where he won the O'Brien Prize. He holds a master's in public health and a medical degree, both from Cambridge University. Before studying medicine, he also represented Great Britain in the International Biology Olympiad. Please welcome Greg Lewis. Thank you very much, Angeline. Sorry for making you have to quote my own puffery back at me. But at least it's, um, <laughs> and also, apologies for my voice. I've been speaking somewhat too much and listening somewhat too little. Especially when I can listen to things like this. So thank you so much, Daniel, for the excellent talk, an excellent presentation will help me when I'm doing my own introductory talks on how to do them somewhat, more better, somewhat better than I've done before. 
Um, questions on the particular work you've done so far. I have two main ones, which might be like prompt for discussion. Um, one is that it seems to me, I think about things in terms of roadmaps as like a wannabe policy wonk. It seems the key thing here is simply the technology is currently not yet there to have sufficient capacity, no matter what regulatory economic barriers are in place. I mean, to reserve sufficient chemical or microbiome, to reserve sufficient like plant capacity for these things is going to require like, several orders of magnitude more than existing aggregate medical production yeah. in the world, which seems like even impossible if you spend like a lot of US GDP on it. So it seems like well, may argue if you're like thinking like sort of things to target to policymakers first is simply please invest more in platform technologies. And the other things are sort of like nice to have at this stage, but seem to not have so much relevance in terms of, well, maybe we can do this for maybe flu and one other thing out of like the N possible yeah. things we could be worried about. But w maybe I'm being oversimplistic, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would broadly agree with that assessment, but I think the story is a little more nuanced than you just presented. So um, I think there's actually another set of technologies that can be helpful in the interim. Uh, and I'll just quickly point them out here. This is quite a complicated slide, but um, it summarizes different technology c categories based on how flexible they are and how efficient they can be at scale. Now, this in the top left is you know, efficient at scale, but extremely inflexible, which is where we're at right now. Um, there's another category of technologies called flexible manufacturing technologies that could incrementally improve flexibility. These are things like using disposable bags in your bioreactors so that if you're producing one product and want to switch to another one, you can just throw out that plastic bag and use the same bioreactor without spending like three months um, sterilizing every single you know, piece of your equipment. Um, I think for you know, a range of plausibly bad pathogens that um, we might face, this could improve capabilities. Um, so I think it is worth doing some like interim uh, policies in the meantime to try to achieve those benefits. I mean, one maybe follow up to that is like, what sort of surge capacity do these things currently have and what do you foresee? What, what kind of? What sort of like order of magnitude increase can you get from these intermediate yeah. technologies? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, the, the industry is already moving in this uh, direction and implementing these technologies could reduce turnover times from a factory, um, switching from one product to another from say 12 months to maybe three to six months. Um, so I think, uh, now that's within kind of a band of products that they, th that are capable of being produced using those equipments. So I think it is a meaningful improvement, but it's not really, you know, you know we're, if everyone's gonna die in three months, it's not, it's not gonna solve that problem. Alas. Um, <laughs> but I essentially agree insofar as it seems, I tend to be like needlessly abstract, but it seems like reducing like the vulnerability surface, even incrementally seems to be valuable, even if we don't yet have a single silver bullet, but hopefully. Right. On which one? One further, so one further question, because I appreciate time is short, and I imagine you guys have much better questions than I do, is you mentioned, like, I think the costs for some of the things you're mentioning are sort of on the region of like 0.5 to $5 billion, which is of the order of like US int entire spending on biosecurity. So right. the archetypal EA question is obviously, how would you prioritize this amongst the entire portfolio of biosecurity work? So do you have like a sense of yeah. how you'd price this in on the margin versus, it's a very hard question, but. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, this is kind of summarizes um, US investment in biosecurity, um, pandemic preparedness, and other hazards like chemical, radiological, nuclear, et cetera, um, which, you know, it's a couple billion for biosecurity each year, you know, maybe 10 billion broadly for multi-hazard preparedness. Um, I, would, I would put investment in platform technologies, you know, near the top. Um, there may be even more crucial investments we could be making in accelerating development timelines for new, um, for new countermeasures. So things like broad spectrum antivirals might be even more important, but uh, I do think investment in platform technologies um, would be better than, than some of the investment the government is currently making and certainly is worth increasing this budget by a billion a year, 10% increase each year would be very worthwhile. And if I have a cheeky follow-up, you seem to have to slice everything on my questions. I promise <laughs> it wasn't staged. Um, 
So speaking of which, of course, there's like a question of terms like prioritizing between the options you yourself have selected, because I think you mentioned like maybe the federal government could like fund BioShield, which is like vaccine stockpiles, which feels to me as like a GCBR person be like pretty not I should choose my words carefully I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> seems to like very limited value because you can only stockpile a certain set number of vaccines. Yeah. But doing that might cost four billion dollars in itself. And I'd far rather spend four billion on like this than that. But I'm wondering if I may be missing something from how you look at it. Yeah, so, so my understanding of, of BioShield is it funds stockpiles, but it also funds like development um, of countermeasures and manufacturing capabilities. Um, I think it's, uh, I could be wrong about that, but I think stockpiles are kind of a nice to have, but not as crucial as, you know, developing new countermeasures. So that's what I had uh, in mind with that. But we could chat more about that after. Yes, I guess we're in furious agreement. So I, maybe we should hand over to audience questions as well as my Thank you. Yeah, we do have a couple of audience questions. Um, so uh, one audience member asks, is there any possibility that some of these platform technologies that you described could also pose a dual use concern? It's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, advancements in delivery mechanisms of delivering DNA and RNA to cells and getting that protein expressed by the cells probably could plausibly um, have have some real dual use concerns. Um, you know, not being a scientist on this, you know, Gregory, you, you might have a better better view. Um, based on what I have heard from scientists, I think it would be worth the risk because there are many other ways you could develop like completely catastrophic um, pandemics without using this. But yeah, I don't know if. Yeah, I mean, to a first approximation, all of biotechnology is dual use, and you're sort of always like playing in terms like index of suspicion in terms like misuse risk. And I agree with the question of there's like a risk, a risk of misuse, like especially, and you identify the thing I'll be most concerned about probably within them. Um, I do think with that being said, you want to differentially enhance as far as one can, I think we should like look much safer. So I'm keen to see that rather than like people synthesize pathogens from scratch like they've been doing in the past. Okay, and then one more question. Um, so one audience member also asks, how do the R&D capabilities of other countries such as China compared to the US, um, could we potentially you know, team up with other countries to accelerate some of this um, uh, development of platform technologies or flex flexible manufacturing methods a bit more? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, I definitely think there should be international co cooperation. My understanding is that the US and Europe is much more advanced in terms of biopharmaceutical manufacturing, um, and China is more advanced, it just has more capacity in terms of um, synthetic manufacturing of small molecules. So I, my suspicion is that a lot of this research would be done in the US and Europe, um, but I'm not an expert in that area, so I could be wrong about that. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thank Daniel and Greg one more time.